Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm here to talk about security versus compliance in healthcare. So just, first, just a general disclaimer. Views and opinions here are my own and not those of my past, current, or post-apocalyptic employers. <laughs> so just a general overview of uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, mainly involves the use of uh, shared Windows accounts in medical facilities and the risks that come with that and what can be done to um, mitigate those risks while still maintaining ease of access because in a medical environment that is very important that you know doctors, nurses, and whoever that need to access that data can access that system very quickly. Okay, so a little bit about um, my background and what kind of inspired me to uh, give this talk, which is I, I work primarily as a, as a network defender, uh, intelligence analyst, malware analyst, very, very much on the defensive side of things. I, I, I haven't done any pen testing professionally, but I do think a lot about the offensive side of things because that's how, how you, ha you have to, def in order to defend, you have to know how to attack. So as I go, into medical centers, as soon as I see an unlocked machine, my criminal mind kicks in, and I think, oh, the, the things somebody could do with those. Um, and that, that, that kind of gave me the inspiration for this talk. And so, uh, for, whenever you go to a, do a doctor's office or a hospital, Chances are you see a situation like this, where, uh, where the, um, the the machine in the doctor's office there is sitting and unlocked, um, Windows sessions logged in, but the medical program is is that session is locked. Uh, that that particular medical program that's running right now is I think the most popular one in the United States. That's uh, Hyperspace by Epic Systems. And you probably can't tell in that picture, but that what it's showing on the machine right now is a message that says, the session is secure. You know, it's a, it's a really nice uh, uh, kind of reassuring message that, okay, you know, I, I as a, the, the health professional have clicked that secure button, I'm good. Uh, and that situation is so common I found that image literally, if you Google computer in exam room, that's what will come up. And you know, if, if you've ever, you know, the, if you, when you visit a doctor or a specialist, especially, you're likely going to be sitting in, in an exam room alone with that computer for quite a bit of time. Actually, it took me a long time to find any kind of study that looked at exactly how long someone's in an exam room alone. I found a lot of studies that examined the overall time that patients spend in an appointment and what can be done to kind of speed that up. But that was the only study that I found that studied that. But anecdotally, based on my experience of going with different specialists and uh, talking with uh, friends and family, uh, that, that matches up pretty well, even though the uh, sample size on this study wasn't as large as I would have liked. So, how can someone a attack this machine when they've got that much time on their hands? You know, uh, t talk to your uh, pen testing buddy or somebody here at the conference and, you know, tell them, oh, you've got a half an hour alone with the machine. What would you do with it? Uh, and th there are, of course, all kinds of different ways that they can attack the machine because they have physical access to it. The system's unlocked. It's logged in. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, the most obvious thing is planting malware. 
Um, but people could just be messing with the machine, not because they're highly technical or they're you know, trying to hack into things, could just be because they're bored. I talked to uh, a couple people I know about this talk, just trying to get a general feedback on what people outside the IT field think about this topic. And I was really shocked when uh, one person I was talking to was like, oh yeah, if they leave the medical session, I'm like, I'd like to get in there and see what they're writing about me. And I'm like, oh geez. And then, you know, I find out that these things, these systems often have completely unfiltered access to the internet. So chances are there probably is somebody who, who is in there who gets really bored and just starts browsing. And so then you open yourself up to potentially drive-by attacks when, you know, someone's just trying to pass the time and they're, they're bored and they don't see anything wrong with what they're doing because the medical record program's locked, hopefully. Um, and so that, that's another situation where maybe there isn't a malicious intent, but that can still cause major problems uh, with uh, drive-by attacks, uh, drive-by ransomware, fake antivirus, that kind of thing that exploits you know, those vulnerable web plugins that pretty much every organization has at some point in that system's existence. And another group of people I talked to, uh, people in the, in the medical industry, trying to get their feel for, okay, if I'm telling you it's this easy, um, what, kind of what's your reaction to, to this issue as a non-technical person, but as someone in healthcare who's, you know, kind of managing these records? And the, the, one of the nurses I talked to asked me, why would someone do that? So that I, I, I realized, oh, I have to go back to my talk now and add a slide. <laughs> cool, why would someone do that? And, uh, you know, it, th there's all kinds of different things that you can do with this information. It could just be because you're nosy and you're wanting to poke around and see what else is going on with you or with somebody else. It could be because you have a personal grudge against somebody. Um, you find out they have some medical condition that maybe the, their relative or significant other, they don't want to find out. Or you start falsifying records. Um, and if the, uh, that, and you can do that all easily without malware, without any sort of fancy things, if they don't bother to lock the medical record program but what I really want to emphasize is locking the medical record program does nothing really uh, to deter an attacker with uh, a decent level of technical knowledge. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything too sophisticated or crazy. Uh, and as, as we've seen, uh, the healthcare industry is being attacked more and more um, for various reasons, some of them opportunistic, some of them not. Uh, for example, with the uh, the OPM hacks, um, uh, you saw major health insurers um, hacked right after uh, OPM uh, by what many reports claim is the same or very closely re related groups. So the kind of um, group wisdom is that these attackers are creating a huge database on people with clearances and other sensitive roles. So you take their their background investigation, plus you take all their health data, so now you know who maybe has a lot of medical debt that, you know, if you're, in, as, if you're trying to conduct espionage, that's extremely valuable because now you can go say, oh, this person has a ton of medical debt. Well, we can offer to make that go away. We can pay that off if they maybe share something with us. Or, you know, that maybe we can falsify their records or find something that they don't want uh, exposed to the world and blackmail or extort them. And so there's a bunch of different things you can do with medical records. <laughs> okay, and so how, you know, it's not just healthcare that kiosks are a part of. I'm, uh, 
I'm talking about healthcare specifically because I, I, I see this problem frequently and over the years it never has seemed to have gotten better and as a network defender that, that bothers me. Um, but kiosks account are not unique to healthcare at all. There are tons of industries that um, use kiosk accounts, shared accounts, system accounts, whatever. Uh, the key difference with healthcare is most of those other systems aren't facing the public. If you've got a, a machine in a warehouse that's got a kiosk account, for example, um, or, a, or a pharmacy or something like that, that's at least behind a desk with a locked door or something like that. With a medical center or a doctor's office, you know, I could just make an appointment with whatever doctor I wanted or try to get a referral to whatever doctor I wanted, and I'm in that office. And I'm alone with a computer for 30 minutes. Uh, so that's what makes healthcare uh, unique when compared to these other industries. And uh, let's talk about uh, exceptions because a lot of times organizations will have policies that say things like shared accounts are discouraged or, you know, shared accounts, uh, we, you know, it is best practice to not use shared accounts. And then you put in an exception because the, the staff wouldn't be able to access their data right now, anywhere, anytime. And, uh, you know, on some level, I get that. It's a hospital. It's a medical center. They, they need, seconds count when you're, either you have a full schedule or you're dealing with a medical emergency. So, uh, you know, timing is important, but thinking back to the CIA triad, the industry seems to be almost 100% focused on availability and not confidentiality and integrity of the data. So one thing I want to emphasize is um, shared accounts provide no accountability. And to, to, to continue the talk with the uh, CIA triad, if you cannot trust the integrity of your systems and your records, uh, there have there, been a few stories out in the media of, of, of various reports of employees uh, stealing medical record data or doing something nefarious with medical record data. And what I would submit to you is how can you be sure of any logs that you have from those medical record systems if anybody can go in and run a keylogger? And I have a slide here that I might have skipped over it, but it lists out various different ways that I've thought of for how an attacker can uh, install malware on a system that's unlocked, whether it's a healthcare kiosk, warehouse kiosk, uh, whatever. Uh, depending on what controls you have in place, it could be something as simple as downloading and executing an EXE. Or if you've got application whitelisting in place, uh, I can run a PowerShell script because PowerShell is part of Windows and you can do all kinds of crazy powerful stuff. And I could deliver that with, uh, if any of you have heard of the USB rubber ducky, that's something to research on because even if you block USB, the USB rubber ducky is a virtual keyboard which will dump the script uh, to, to a file as, as if it were keyboard typing. So you're blocking flash drives. Okay, great, but this is, this is a keyboard that looks like a flash drive that's scripted. I'm running it and in about, oh, two and a half minutes, I've got a script that can start taking screenshots and logging all key logs of your Citrix session, EHR session, whatever I want. Um, and so, but having a locked Windows session would prevent that. So with that in mind, let's talk about uh, countermeasures and talk about how we can actually bring back that balance of that CIA triad provide more confidentiality and integrity while maintaining that ease of access, speed of access, 
that is essential in healthcare. So we have some current authentication options. Uh, we all know passwords are terrible. Um, phone authentication works for a lot of different applications. Healthcare is not one of them because it, you know, doctors and nurses go from room to room uh, authenticating to various systems throughout their day, throughout their rounds. Who's going to want to have to answer a ringing phone or look at a text message you know, every 30 minutes? That's enough to drive you mad. Um, same thing with uh, RSA tokens. <laughs> You know, waiting for that token to cycle if it's about to expire, and then what if the token gets out of sync? Not to mention RSA tokens are incredibly expensive when you're trying to do a large deployment. You have to pay for the hardware, pay for the software licensing for the server, stand up the new servers, and that's not even including, you know, people losing them. Uh, at Biometrics was a, was a solution before... Uh, RFID became popular, uh, biometrics were popular until uh, the industry realized that biometrics aren't so great when you're constantly washing your hands like they do in the medical field. You get lots and lots of false positives, which mean, or, excuse me, false, false negatives, which, it, which causes lots of aggravation, and rightfully so, uh, for the healthcare professionals. So that leaves pretty much only one option that I could think of, and that's smart cards. And there's lots and lots of advantages to using uh, smart cards, also known as CAC, SIB, PIB, depending on if you have experience in the government. They have different terms for this kind of standard that the government helped to develop, and the government's been using across all federal agencies since it was mandated, I believe, by executive order in about 2005. So this is a very mature technology. It's been deployed to very, very large enterprise networks. And um, it, it works really well because um, you, you have, you have a uh, smart card in a, in the keyboard, if you've got a keyboard reader, that works well because you can use the smart card as your ID badge. Uh, so you can have a smart card with regular RFID on it um, that can use for, for door access and that kind of thing, but it can also be used for authenticating to the computer. And the reason I'm suggesting contact smart cards instead of contactless RFID smart cards that you'll see a lot with e-prescriptions and things like that, where doctors will use that as their second factor for uh, issuing prescriptions uh, for, for a couple different reasons. Uh, the advantage of the contact card, where you have to have it physically in the reader, is it can be configured such that through GPOs, so that when you remove the card, the system's totally logged off. So imagine you have separate domain accounts for every single one of your employees, that's tied to their ID, tied to their smart card. In order to go to the next system, they have to pull that card and it totally logs the system out. So you don't have to worry about the system locking and then somebody not being able to get in because the session's locked. But you also don't have to worry about um, having that totally unlocked uh, window session that anybody can just play around with. And what's nice about these keyboard readers is it's really hard to lose your ID because you kind of just, your face is staring back at you as you're typing. Um, and for me, when I worked for the Defense Department, it just became reflex to, get, to just go in and pull that card to the point where when I got in, into organizations that didn't use these kinds of authentication methods, I, I would just kind of reflex, which were, oh yeah, Windows L, you know. Um, but it, it it works really, really well. Now, it can be complicated to set up if you don't have a good PKI system in place. However, there are um, uh, really good managed PKI services, uh, particularly uh, from the organizations that I've worked with. One of them used a 
semantic, and the process was incredibly slick. It integrated with your IDM and ServiceNow, and I'm sure it integrates with a bunch of other things, um, and will issue certificates for you. It will handle the entire life cycle uh, from revocation to whatever else. And because Semantic is, an, is a uh, recognized CA, instead of having your own internal CA, your certificates will be recognized by other entities. So they can be used, for example, SMIME signed and encrypted email. Uh, so other organizations will automatically recognize that. So there are lots of advantages that smart cards give you beyond just session authentication. You can use them to authenticate to, uh, to your internal mobile apps, your intranet, do single sign-on for just about anything in, in addition to the email communication piece. Um, so, so some other basic things, uh, you know, restrict removable media. That won't help with the USB rubber ducky, as I mentioned, but why make it any easier on the, the attacker if you can help it? Um, keep systems physically away so that it, it's much more difficult for someone to reach a USB port. Most of the medical in, uh, facilities that I've been in, they'll have the, the, the system just mounted under a desk or whatever else. And conveniently, like every other modern computer, even if it's a thin client, there are USB ports right in the front. Thank you. Um, you know, so finding a way to keep that system either somehow locked up or in a cabinet or some sort of physical security controls around that system definitely does help too. Uh, application whitelisting. Uh, again, a PowerShell script could get around this, but it also helps prevent a large number of attacks. What I'm trying to say here is there is no magic bullet. You're going to have to do defense in depth to truly secure this system and use a series of controls. But once you get these controls in place, you have a very, very secure kiosk. And most of these uh, 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 healthcare systems are kiosk systems. They're basically meant to run one or two applications. Uh, so if you know those applications, uh, for example, uh, Windows App Locker can automatically inventory all the applications on a on a system, you can use a known good system, and then push that out by a GPO and apply it, and next thing you know, um, nobody should be able to uh, execute any random EXE for if they started downloading freeware sites or something that your web proxy missed or something like that. They won't be able to download, and in in, uh, excuse me, they won't be able to run random installers. Now, the thing with application whitelisting that sometimes people um, don't understand is um, application whitelisting does not protect, in a lot of cases, against exploits because the exploits, browser exploits and things like that, will run under the context of the browser or the office program or whatever application they're running. So they may not spawn a new process exactly the same way that the application whitelisting is expecting and it won't be blocked. Um, for example, uh, uh, a lot of people use uh, Citrix for uh, uh, virtualized applications, and Citrix sessions can actually be vulnerable to web compromises, even if you have that executable control enabled, because it's running under the context of the browser. So, uh, restricting internet communications. So there are a couple different ways to go about doing this, depending on what your organization is comfortable with. Um, uh, some organizations are, are leveraging uh, next generation firewalls, Palo Alto and the like, but you don't need anything particularly fancy to have secure communications. You just have to uh, build in and design your security controls uh, well to fit your environment. Uh, do, do, does your medical record program really need to access the internet for anything other than web browsing and your internal email? Probably not. Um, so restrict it so that just your web proxy and no external email or anything like that can go out and you're good. 
uh, lots of medical organizations are now using VDI to deploy their EHR systems. And honestly, I'm, I'm not sure what the advantage is of deploying your client over a, a Citrix application when it's a when it's a thick client box that you've got sitting on a, on a desk somewhere anyway. But if you turn that model around, where instead of virtualizing the medical record application, you just have a browser that's in Citrix that people can use to access, the, your employees can use to access the public internet. And then you restrict the actual browser on the system to just your intranet that means that they can use that virtualized browser to do the unsafe browsing of the just internet at, at large. So if the session does get compromised, all they all they compromised was that virtual machine session. They didn't compromise the any of the uh, the system that's actually running the EHR or, or other sensitive programs. So. Some other critical controls. I am a huge fan of Microsoft Emmet. Now, you may have heard recent publications that say, oh, Emmet can be used to attack Emmet. Well, that came out right as soon as Microsoft patched it in version 5.5. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. And also with version 5.5, they, uh, put, they created GPOs so you can centrally manage Emmet policies. And you also may have heard that Emmet breaks applications. But by default, if you leave the settings at default and import the recommended profiles, Emmet will only provide additional, additional protections to the applications that are most frequently targeted that it knows how to protect. For example, Java, uh, Adobe Reader, Office products, your browsers, those sorts of things. Uh, so if you just leave it at the default and don't turn it up to 11, which I still would recommend trying just for the additional security protections. But Emmet should not break applications, even legacy applications, with its uh, default settings. And Microsoft is a really useful user guide for its later versions for uh, deployment details. Um, some, some other good controls is uh, ha have multi-factor authentication uh, anytime you have a system that can be accessed remotely, such as your webmail. There are attackers out there who will look for organizations that have large numbers of users, such as schools, hospitals, uh, various enterprises, and have open uh, and have public access webmail with single factor authentication. Because all they have to do is send out this really fake looking form that says, hey, we're IT, we need you to update your password. They steal passwords from the phishing form, and it can be a form of varying quality. They will probably find someone in your organization who will submit that form. And a lot of these attackers, they don't care who it is that they get. They just get an account that can access webmail, so they can spew out their, uh, their uh, 519 scams or whatever it is they're wanting to spew out, and next thing you know, your organization might end up on a mailing block list, or at the very least, might damage your organization's reputation. And that's at the minimum of what people can do with publicly accessible web services. They can do a whole lot more if you have single factor authentication. Citrix, for example, now they've got a full computing session that's on your network. So think about what services you've got that are public that are single factor auth where the credentials are, are probably extremely easy to steal and otherwise obtain. Uh, if you don't have a good IP, PS in place, Suricata is open source. You can, the, they have an open source rule set that's built in. The commercial rule set from emerging threats is uh, extremely cheap as uh, security feeds go. So that, that might be something worth uh, looking into. Uh, tune your antivirus. I hear a, a meme that goes on a lot of times with various vendors saying AV is dead. It's not dead. You just don't, can't depend on it to block 100% of everything, just like you can't depend on any control, one control to do that. Uh, you just need to work at tuning it. A lot of uh, major AV vendors have pretty good heuristics. They're just not turned on or turned up by default. So play around with those settings and see how high you can make them without breaking things 
And I think you'll be surprised uh, that, that it's going to be extremely rare uh, or never if things break when you do that. So the uh, next big trend, I touched on this a little bit, is, uh, is VDI. And I've seen a lot of um, medical organizations who will deploy very sensitive applications as like Citrix apps or Citrix desktops. I saw uh, one organization who actually deployed a Windows 7 Citrix session with running Epic, but the host itself that was logging on to Citrix was Windows XP. And so if I can compromise the host easily, and I can start key logging on Citrix sessions, I can start taking screenshots and key logging or doing whatever I want to do to the host that's connecting to Citrix and, uh, and spy on that just like I would uh, a, a physical host running a physical application. So VDI, in a lot of ways, doesn't provide you with additional protection, but it does help, like I mentioned earlier, for uh, browsing activities and things that are untrusted, unsafe, instead of virtualizing things that are sensitive like EHR. So, um, uh, in conclusion, right now, from what I've seen, most of the controls and the risk, especially around multi-factor, are focused on electronic prescriptions because that's what's mandated by law. Uh, and it seems to be mo mostly focused around protecting against prescription fraud. But as a patient, I care much, much more about the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of my medical records. I really cannot think of anything that is more personal to me, more important to me, to my health, safety, and privacy than my health records. And you know, as a security professional, I would like to see those well protected. And I understand the needs of hospitals and that things that change takes time, especially something as major as okay, now you all have separate domain accounts and you've got to use this thing called a smart card and it, it, it would be a big cultural change. But what I would emphasize to managers and higher-ups in your legal department is if you had a breach, and we all know for, for anybody, it's usually not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. With a breach, if everything's coming from the same account, how can you know which employee was the one that clicked that phishing link? Which employee stole that data? Which system was involved? Which user account was involved? If you've got that all at the application layer, that's not going to help any investigator, no matter who, what outside service you hire. They're going to have their work cut out for them um, for, for, for that reason. Whereas if you have separate accounts, you've now eliminated that extremely plausible deniability of hey, you know, we, we've got your, your epic logs, for example, that say you access this patient, this patient, this patient's record. If I'm a defense attorney, I, I, and, you know, I, I'm sitting there thinking, well, if I can go up to any system and install a keylogger, and my client is on at least five different systems a day walking around to exam room to exam room, how, as a prosecution, do you disprove that there's not a Trojan or some kind of malware that could be stealing passwords on any one of those machines that access? It's next to impossible, and it's extremely plausible deniability. So, if, you, if your managers are wondering, you know, why it is this is a good idea, even just from a management perspective and a legal perspective, a risk perspective, uh, having shared accounts is dangerous. And that's why most policies, one of their first few rules, I know it is in the DISA STIG, the, the policies of the Defense Department use, one of the very first few rules is shared accounts, system accounts, 
uh, w will not be used, period. Uh, and now, of course, there are poems and exceptions and stuff like that, but there really shouldn't be because there are solutions like uh, smart cards that can give you very quick access to systems. You can make Windows logins really quick if you tune your Windows desktop right. Uh, and you'll have your EHR program automatically start, that kind of thing. So you can still maintain that ease of access, that speed of access, and give, give everybody a little bit more security in the process from end to end. And here's my uh, reference to that one study. If you're more, if you're in, interested in you know uh, the time that the patients spend in a in an appointment, that's the study that I used. And uh, any questions? Thanks. All right. Right, and I should say that the, what I am talking about here isn't the kind of breach that's been happening. They've been coming from the outside, from the edge of networks, and they've mostly been opportunistic attacks, mostly. They haven't really been targeted attacks. They've just been you know, fin financially motivated attackers who've gotten lucky and targeted a large organization like a hospital. Um, what, what this is more about was that potential of you know, someone being on the inside, whether it's a patient or a doctor or whatever, and being nosy or manipulating records. But yeah, that, that transition I think would take time because you know the, 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 the doctors and nurses are used to being able to go up to whatever system they want and just being able to open up the medical application just instantly and just do things. And when they're used to doing that for years, and now all of a sudden you say, now you've got this new fancy ID badge, and here's what you do, you have a pen, you log in. It's really not that much additional effort, but because it's so new and people have been doing it for so long, in, in not just in the medical field, but in general, in IT, whenever you have that kind of situation, th th there's gonna be a little bit of confusion, a little bit of pushback, so explaining to people why this needs to be done, I, th I think, uh, is important, and P PKI can be incredibly complicated if your organization is not used to dealing with certificate issuance and revocation and management in the life cycle. That's why these uh, the cloud services like Semantics Cloud PKI can be really useful and help you take that, that uh, workload off. I, I talked with a couple of colleagues who, who uh, used to work for hospitals and one of them brought up a very good point which is, uh, who pays for this? And I, I, came, I came up with an idea and I have really no idea if this would work in practice, because like I said, I've never worked for a hospital myself, but ID badges are normally the realm of physical security and access control. Um, so what I might suggest, and again, I don't know how practical this is, is physical security could pay for the smart cards themselves IT or whoever manages your desktops or whatever else, whatever department uh, pays for the the uh, reader, the reader keyboards, and the uh, whatever PKI solution, whether internal or external, they, they manage all the software controls. And you can get smart cards with RFID on them so they work with your existing physical access controls or a magnetic stripe or whatever it is you use. So they can be kind of an all-in-one badge and just kind of fit into your regular badge issuing process uh, is the best way to do it. That's what every organization I've known that uses smart cards do. They have kind of one ID to rule them all and it's just their regular badge issuing process is a smart card. Yeah.
yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, and that's a very, very good point. Um, part of my reason for giving this talk is I think security security is kind of uh, on on the back burner for medical professionals, and I, in a way, it kind of should be. Security is everybody's responsibility, but I don't expect a doctor or a nurse to know the you know nitty gritty of information security. I don't think most patients or doctors or nurses or anybody involved recognizes, hey, that's an unlocked computer and that's an extremely huge security problem. I'll point it out to my doctors and nurses as a patient and their response was, oh, well, I shouldn't leave you alone with the computer. <laughs> right. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I think if more patients were aware of and like heard this talk, if I were a non non IT security person and I'm telling somebody I can start spying on your medical records in two and a half minutes at the large majority of hospitals, I would be saying to my healthcare provider, uh, what are you guys doing about this? But I think it's because that, you know, a healthcare IT has just been done the same way for so long that unless you're in IT, whether it's a patient or a, um, or a, uh, a healthcare provider, that, 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 that doesn't really cross their minds. And even when it does, when I talk to doctors and nurses about this, the reactions I get are, why would anyone do that? And my favorite one was, wouldn't that make people mad? Uh, you know, dis discussing this, that, you know, that, that, that we're about, you know, Oh, we, you know, you're, you're talking about how easy it is to get into these things. And it's like that, but I'm talking about this risk. Um, I, ha I had a doctor tell me that, you know, wouldn't that make people mad? And it's like, what would make me mad as a patient is finding out there was a data breach because someone was browsing some Facebook game and got pwned with a flash ad on, and not now every single subsequent doctor and nurse who logged into it has their credentials stolen by pony or something like that. That, that. that would just drive me insane. But yeah, I do think there needs to be a wider education and awareness of this whole issue from across the spectrum, from patients and doctors and management and whoever, and get them all together and realize this is, this is, a, this is a big issue. This is an important issue. And it certainly is to me as somebody with chronic health problems who goes into a bunch of different medical facilities and I see the same thing happen at every single one. Uh, and I really don't know, you know, how to bring that up to people because I'll bring it up to my, you know, care practitioners and they're not IT people, so they're kind of just like, oh, well, this is the way it is, you know? <laughs> Yeah, exactly, and, and that's why hopefully by, by the, what, what, the way I wanted to do this talk was not to say, oh my God, you know, sky is falling, you guys should do something right now, is actually hopefully offer up some practical solutions that have been implemented uh, for years now, um, for, for, for over a decade now, and it's a very well understood standard, smart cards are, if you use something like a cloud PKI service like Semantic, you, uh, your, uh, the federal government will trust your certs. So if you're doing something like FISMA or you're involved with uh, the uh, various healthcare agencies of the federal government, your signatures will come up as valid and trusted. They have a P PKI bridge. So there's all kinds of uh, side effect benefits to having this kind of deployment too. So there, there's lots of positives and really the only negatives are the initial growing pains. And after that, you get a lot of good benefits for security and for uh, just general communication. That's a really, really good question, and I've thought about it because there are lots of industries, and, and, and not just healthcare, 
if it isn't regulated, it doesn't happen. But I, I'm not sure I 100% trust a, a, a group of politicians who may not be that tech savvy to do it right and not make it overly burdensome and just have it as a mandate from heaven without any without either without de without enough detail or too much detail where it's very very rigid or it just says yeah you should do that thing yeah. and uh, so, uh DOD does have rules but unless you're you know directly involved with VA or something like that they're probably not going to apply to you um I I, I think this really needs to be a private sector kind of push. I'm just not sure how to get there. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we, uh, there's almost a need, really, for some, you know, PCI is self-regulated of the payment card industry. I think there almost needs to be some sort of healthcare consortium that puts out best practices by healthcare for healthcare. Um, you know. Yes, HIPAA and high tech are, I think, purposely a, a little bit vague. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.